Betrayal is a bitch. You put your trust in someone just to have that trust thrown back in your face. Someone who lies and betrays those who have put their trust in them have absolutely no honour. And there are few cultures more obsessed with honour than the samurai culture of ancient Japan. Nowadays, Japan is a lot more pacified with their Gundams and 2D femboys. Thank you very much for that. But back in the day, these were some of the nastiest bastards you could come across. Atrocities committed in the name of the Emperor have quite a long history, from Nanking to Pearl Harbor. While I'm sure that we're all very glad that the days of planes being flown in suicide bombing attempts is finished, at least by the Japanese, there are a subset of Japanese citizens who cling to the old ways and wish to return to that conservative, closed-off, honour-bound samurai culture. Some of these folks can be found within the Yakuza, as the ideology of the organised crime syndicate throughout history has been to defend the weak and fight the strong, no matter the legality. When a Yakuza breaks these codes and brings great dishonour to the ideals that they once espoused, some people could get irritated and seek revenge. Perhaps someone from the most unlikely of places. Mitsuyasu Maeno. Here are some words I never thought I would say together. The Yakuza porn star kamikaze pilot. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get into the video, a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an easy to use learning community with hundreds of different classes to master or improve your skills. Whether you are a beginner or not, there is always something new for you to learn. Skillshare can help you make the most of 2022, a new year of learning, growth and connection through creativity. If learning and improving yourself is your new year's resolution, then Skillshare is for you. Since I do a lot of gardening whenever the ground isn't completely frozen solid, you know, Scottish problems, I took the class Gardening 101, a guide for growing and caring for plants, which I found to be very informative. One thing that I like about Skillshare is that the classes are as long or as short as you want them to be, and most of the time you are shown exactly what to do. And the first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description down below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. So go down below and click the link. Not a lot is known about Mitsuyasu's life before his sudden rise to infamy, but it is not a life that was particularly happy. He had been married and divorced twice, and he had even attempted suicide, which is very unlike the Japanese. This suicide may have been related to his romantic failings, or it could have been due to the pain of living in California, while he took acting classes at the University of California in 1967. As with a lot of troubled young Japanese men at the time, he fell in with far-right ultra-nationalists and specifically was inspired by a very prominent member of the Banzai Brigade and a potential mad lad himself, Yukio Mishima. Mishima was a political author among many other things and he was also not a fan of the direction in which Japan was headed after their defeat in World War II. Mishima believed that Japan was becoming too influenced by the West and was losing its culture, to the point of believing that the Japanese people would become rootless. He founded an unarmed civilian militia with the goal of restoring glory to the emperor, and a lot of Japanese ultra-patriots followed him. 
But I mean, what the fuck is an unarmed militia? That's, that's just a bunch of guys hanging out. That's not a militia. This ideological group that Mitsuyasu and Mishima were a part of were known as the Romantic Rightists, and in contrast to the Nazis or fascists of Western far-right culture, these rightists had two main ideas that made up their movement. The first being that the 1947 Japanese peace constitution was the worst thing to happen to Japan since the Hiroshima heatwave, and that Japan should return to a Bushido-style samurai culture. Reject the enemy, return to honorable. <laughs> Yukio Mishima took his movement so far that on November 25th, 1970, his militia, which Mitsuyasu was not a part of, entered a military base in Tokyo and took the commandant there hostage. Then, Mishima got up on the roof and gave a speech, trying to encourage the Japanese self-defence forces to rise up against the constitution of defeat and restore the land of the rising sun to what it once was. After his speech, Mishima repeated the infamous phrase that many a GI in the Pacific theatre had heard before. Tenno Haika Banzai. Long live the emperor. With that, Proclamation, Mishima went back inside and did what any samurai fighting a losing battle would do. Committed seppuku, a samurai method of ritual self-disembowelment designed to be the most painful way to kill yourself in order to restore your honour. Mishima was a man of culture, but he wasn't an idiot. And after he disemboweled himself, he had his number two guy at the ready with a sword to cut off his head so that he would be spared the pain of bleeding out. However, Mishima's number two guy apparently hadn't studied the blade enough because he tried three times to cut off Mishima's head and failed, instead just causing him a lot more pain. So another guy had to step in. The number two guy then promptly committed seppuku himself, insisting that he couldn't let Mishima die alone. Although, I think that was just done as a cope for being absolutely shit at the one job he had. Despite his grand ideas, Mishima's display only served to irritate the soldiers and literally cut the head off of his own beast, leaving a lot of people like Mitsuyasu without their figure to follow. And when your father figure leaves your life, where do you turn? To porn, that's right. I mean, definitely if you're a woman. But Mitsuyasu went to porn as well. Yes, his acting classes hadn't quite carried his talent to the levels of superstardom that he had hoped. So, to make ends meet, he decided to dip his toes and other parts of his anatomy into softcore pink films as the money was actually a lot better. Mitsuyasu's most famous film was a little number by the name of Tokyo Emmanuel, in which he performed some demonetizing acts whilst flying a plane. Turns out that Mitsuyasu was actually made for this role because he was an avid amateur pilot and he was registered to the Taiyo Flying Club, which meant that he really knew his way around her cockpit and also his own. In the business, we call this foreshadowing because, I mean, all of this is obviously very safe. It's not like Japanese ultra-nationalists have any kind of, you know, history with doing mental stuff in planes. It wouldn't be long until Mitsuyasu found a new figurehead to follow, who happened to be Yoshio Kadama, a Yakuza boss and right-wing leader. Kadama had made his fortune in World War II by smuggling drugs for the Japanese government using connections that he had in Korea, making him very wealthy. But, as we all know, Japan lost that war, and in the war's aftermath, Kadama was arrested as a Class A war criminal. At this point in history, the US wasn't one to keep a good right-wing influence in a foreign country down, remember those days, better times, 
So they released Kadama in 1948 in order to let him use his fortune and contacts to aid in the fight against the growing tide of communism in East Asia. Kadama also used his Yakuza influence to suppress anything that he deemed a little bit too left of centre, such as breaking up a labour movement in the Hokutan coal mine. Mitsuyasu seemed to really take to this new leader, as did most of the romantic right, and Mitsuyasu attended a meeting in 1971 at the Okura Hotel, where Kadama's attempt at a new national anthem was featured, and it was called The Song of Race. That's a little on the nose. But just like any other major cult of personality leader, it wouldn't be long until Kadama was caught up in something that would cause his followers to turn against him. And that was exactly what happened in 1976, with the break of the Lockheed bribery scandals. Since the 1950s, the Lockheed Aircraft Company had been bribing government officials and powerful people all over the world, so they could get their airplanes sold over the competition. This included the replacement of anything from military jets to commercial airliners. Japan was not the only country in which this happened, but it was the one with the most ironic backlash. Kadama had accepted over $7 million to bribe Japanese officials into buying Lockheed aircrafts, and this act completely disillusioned Mitsuyasu. He thought that the scandal was very dishonorable and completely went against the samurai code that Kadama had been inspiring people to live their lives by. Mitsuyasu stewed in his wrath for a while, then had an idea. If these Japanese officials wanted planes, Oh, they were going to get planes. In March of 1976, Mitsuyasu conducted a few recon sweeps in the air of the Setagaya neighbourhood in Tokyo, where Kadama lived, using his amateur pilot skills and a plane that he acquired. You know, just get in the lay of the land. Nothing suspicious going on here. On the 23rd of March 1976, Mitsuyasu and two friends showed up at the Chofu airport, all fully decked out in kamikaze bomber attire. They had rented two planes and they told the staff that they were shooting a movie about kamikaze pilots. The friends had a little photo shoot in front of the Piper Cherokee that Mitsuyasu would be flying. Then they took off a little before 9am. Mitsuyasu took his own plane and his friends went up in the other. They flew around Tokyo for an hour before finally arriving at Setagaya, the location of Yoshio Kadama's house. It was showtime. At 9.50am, Mitsuyasu called out his plane's number and said to his friends through the radio, sorry I haven't replied for a long time. Mitsuyasu then decreases his altitude, circled around his boss's house twice, then cried out Tenno Haika Banzai and kamikazed right into his boss's house. His kamikaze strike hit a balcony on the second floor and obviously Mitsuyasu died instantly. There was no dramatic explosion but a fire did break out, although it was quickly put out by Kadama's bodyguards with Mitsuyasu's body later being described as charred with exposed organs because it turns out there are some things that jet fuel can melt. But it was totally worth it because Mitsuyasu got his revenge. He showed Kadama who was boss while also copying his idol and going out like a Japanese patriot. There was just one teeny tiny little problem there. Kadama was at the opposite side of the house. It was completely uninjured. Yes. You see, you see where the smoke is in this picture. That is where Mitsuyasu's plane hit the house. The little red mark is where Kadama was. <laughs> Mitsuyasu hit the wrong side of the fucking house. And to add insult to injury, Kadama was carried out of the house 
wrapped in a nice cosy blanket. So not only was he completely unharmed, but he was barely even disturbed. Mitsuyasu went to all that effort just to turn himself into a pile of steaming teppanyaki and Kadama was just all cosy and snug. This, Mitsuyasu did completely destroy the front of the house and injure two of Kadama's servants, but ultimately his plan completely failed. In the aftermath of the kamikaze attack, around 20 of Mitsuyasu's right-wing buddies gathered outside the house for a scrap with the cops, achieving just as much as Mitsuyasu himself did. Kadama's bodyguards also joined in the fun after putting out the fire by beating up some nearby journalists. Beste. Kadama himself received many calls to commit Sudoku, which he ignored. Although, despite how badly Mitsuyasu seemed to have failed, his sacrifice may not have been a complete waste. While Kadama wasn't willing to self-oof, the protesters' calls for him to be indicted for his crimes were answered. Kadama was arrested and supposed to stand trial in 1977, but the trial was postponed because he faked an illness and refused to leave his home. And after a while of living a similar lifestyle to all of his detractors, on the 17th of January 1984, Kadama died of a stroke before his trial was completed at the ripe old age of 72. So in the end, Mitsuyasu really did die for nothing. <laughs> however, however, Kadama himself was apparently impressed by Mitsuyasu's bravado. So, you know, there's... There's that. Sadly, that bravado didn't go down well with Mitsuyasu's own group, who disavowed him because he was motivated by selfishness instead of actually wanting to serve his country. But at least he died like his idol. As an egotistical show-off. <laughs> However, the Japan Self-Defence Forces did commend him on the execution of his attack, saying, and I quote, Very skillful. I give him the highest marks on that score. Mitsuyasu may not have gotten the justice that he sought, but at least he got an S for effort. Ultimately, there's there's no lesson or message or theme to be derived from this story. I just I just think that the premise itself is wild enough to make it into Mad Lads. An ultra nationalist Bushido porn star carrying out an aerial kamikaze attack on his Yakuza boss's house because he bribed people into buying planes. You just, who who could make that up? Who could make that up? The Yakuza writers could probably make that up, and I am amazed that they haven't used this story yet. But at least Mitsuyasu got to make one last porno, called Twink Explodes in Boss's Face. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!